What is up, our fellow Monarch Monstars? We are doing another breakdown video of the recent episode eight, Birthright of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. We're gonna be talking about it, bringing up some of them Easter eggs, talking about a certain theory that we had during our watch party. This was definitely uh, an improvement from episode seven, I feel like. Episode eight, really starting to kick in, getting closer to the finale. We got two more episodes left a monarch legacy of monsters so i am excited to have you guys all here thank you so much for hanging out with the battalion community as we discuss all things godzilla in this matter i'm excited uh but before we begin let's go through all the pleasantries real quick like following us on one of our social media pages like tiktok instagram twitter threads if you have it at the underscore bat channel this is a wonderful way to get in touch with us, DM us, talk about what's going on in your life, or maybe something that you saw on social media that you're like, dude, how are you not talking about this? Or a trailer came out, you know, and you're like, oh my God, do some, do some content, Trey. Um, and then there's Super Bro Corey just appearing because he doesn't like secrets. You know, he's like, I forgot guy. that I arrived first and I didn't switch us back Aww. to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, Super Bro? Good, buddy. How are you doing, my friend? Doing well. I'm Good. excited to talk about today's show. Me too. Um, I'll let you continue. <laughs> thank you. I, I appreciate it. It's always good to see Super Bro Corey. Uh, but yes, guys, another way to help out our channel is to smash that like, share this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. Help us get to 3,000 subs. We are so close, and we can't do it without you guys spreading the word, talking about how much you're having fun in the community and joining our show. We love you guys. This is why we do it. We don't make shows without you. So help us out. Let's get this community even bigger. Expand with our Godzilla community because this show, ups and downs for sure. But overall, I feel like it's been very, very solid. You know, just in terms of storytelling, yeah. especially when the legacy cast shows up. Am I right, Super Bro? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I love you know me. I love the legacy cast, man. So anytime we get legacy cast, I'm in for it. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And of course, guys, you can check out our previous breakdowns of episode seven and all the previous ones, our watch parties. We are going to do our next watch party live stream of episode nine. So make sure you guys set your reminders after this show. I'll be setting it up so that way you guys can join us at our usual time at 9 45 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for us to join and get your popcorn ready as we react and experience the show together. So I'm excited. This one, I think, I think I see a lot of people asking in the chat if we're going to get Operation Hourglass, and I think so. I think they're they're now going to reveal what's going on. So Corey, who's all in the chat today? Man, it's popping up in here, Trey. We got a lot of people. We got Oracle Clock Tower. What's up, Oracle? Red Hooded Outlaw. Beyond the Night, The Butler, The Batman Who Laughs, Joker's Wild, Gary Kelly, Wayne Enterprises, Hashtag Restore the Snyderverse Guy, Kaiju Crazy Craig Rowland, King Donkey Kong, Atomic Kaiju 1954, Akio Lee, Dean Classified, Monarch Eyes Only, Red Robin, we got Trevor H. in his house, Beyond the Night, we got people filing in left and right. Hiya, Oracle. We got Broger in the house. We got people. Taladia plays in the house. What's up, everybody? How are we doing today, man? I have to tell you, Trey, before we jump into Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Yes, yes. I heard some talking. Godzilla news. What? I heard Godzilla Minus One has officially surpassed Shin Gojira. It did, yeah. Now that it's it's a closing in on $80 million mm. global uh, for its box office take, so... That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Absolutely incredible for mm. for Godzilla minus one, and rightfully and deserving. USA is like like really like back in this movie, huh, Trey? Like the the numbers are showing that you know we're we're eating it up over here. Yeah, and for a movie that didn't even cost fifteen million dollars, it's putting mm. a lot of big blockbuster Hollywood films to shame. Uh, all things considering, and you know what I love about it, Corey. What's that? Uh, is they asked one of the producers of Godzilla Minus One, you know, of course, with the huge success, you know, Hollywood, when they have success with a movie, mm -hmm. they want to crank out that sequel so fast that the sequel is often disappointing. 
Mm-hmm. And they asked one of the producers of Godzilla Minus One, and like, so what's what's next? What are you, are you guys going to do a sequel to Godzilla Minus One? Are you going to what's what's the plans for G Man? And he said, we're going to take our time. You know, it's not about quantity; it's about quality. You know, we really we want to do a story that is just as, or if not better, than the last film. Which that's going to be tough to do for Godzilla Minus One. And I'm glad they did that, because Corey. I know we haven't done our review yet with our entire Monarch Monstars panel mm-hmm. yet, but you know we're waiting for everyone to to have time to to you know be able to do a show together, so that way we don't miss anybody. Yeah. Um, but one thing I will say about Godzilla minus one is I wasn't really sure where they could go, because that's my thing. Like if you if you don't believe in your heart that you're going to make a better sequel or just as good which your your goal should always to be let's do it better not bigger better top gun and maverick style baby top gun maverick style that was a film what 30 years in the making Corey. Hmm. did you say top gun top gun <laughs> hell yeah uh, top gun you know you already know how <laughs> Corey feels about uh top gun maverick but you know that that's a great example Corey. that was a film 30 years in the making they had pressured tom cruise to make uh, a new Top Gun film, you know, often, you know, after the success of the first one, he was like, no, no, we got to wait for the right story. Mm-hmm. And they did. And you know what? It paid off big time. It's one of the greatest films, I think, in cinema. Uh, you know, it's definitely in the top 50, top 100, you know, it, in that prestigious category of some of the greatest even films top of all five. time. For a Super Bro Corey, top five, you know. Might be even number one. Might even be number one. But I, I love that approach. I think that's very smart on Toho not to go the Hollywood route. Don't go for the money grab. Go for quality because if you do, the audience will show up for Godzilla minus two, whatever they want to call it. Or or if it's something, if it's not related to Godzilla minus one at all, you know. And they actually said that because... With Shin Godzilla, mm. which was one of the most successful Godzilla films of all time, many people were like, well, dude, they got to do a sequel. They got to because they can't leave us on that cliffhanger. And the producer actually said they didn't do it because when the director came back with the sequel idea, they were like, that's not quite it. You know, that's that's not going to do it. That's not quality. I think uh, the sequel's named Godzilla Zero, though. That's what it should be. Named. I think Godzilla is a cool, Godzilla Zero is a really cool title, too. I've mm-hmm. heard people say that. Um, but congratulations to Godzilla minus one. If you haven't seen it yet in theaters, guys, they extended it, I think, till January 5th. Uh, you need to go see it. And for our international audience, uh, I think they just released it in Mexico and a few other uh, South American, you know, cities and countries. So check it out. It's phenomenal. I highly recommend Godzilla minus one. Mm. Definitely one of the best films of 2023, easily. Yes, sir. Easily with a less than $15 million box up mm. budget. Amazing. Right. I completely agree. It's, um, yeah, it was definitely one of my favorite movies this year. That's, I, and that's crazy. That's crazy. It still blows my mind that Corey says that. Um, <laughs> but it's wonderful to see you guys all in the chat. Um, it's just absolutely, I love what Rogu said, you know, Godzilla minus one was made for $15 million and not, not even right. Cause uh director, t- uh, Takashi Yamazaki said that it, he wished it was $15 million. Um, and the fact that it's made three times, four times yeah. its budget is They're insane. like over 44 million in um, America right now, domestically and 35 yeah. million foreign, you know, so mm-hmm. mm. It's 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 absolutely phenomenal. I'm so happy for Godzilla minus one. It's rightfully deserving. It's not, you know, it, it'll be interesting. I've seen a lot of people kind of say, well, this is gonna hurt Godzilla Kong, the new empire, because of how good Godzilla minus one is. And I, I think it I mean, as does anyone think any of the films in the monsterverse have beaten Godzilla minus one in terms of quality of story? Maybe 2014, you could say. I mean, that was pretty that good. Was a good. There was, one. There was yeah, the first barely one was any really Godzilla, good. you know. Um, True. So my thing is, is the general audience, the MonsterVerse is opening up the general audience to checking out these Japanese Toho Godzilla films and to, to building the audience for this TV show on Apple TV with Godzilla Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Like, honestly, it... It's all a good thing, you know, supporting all of the Godzilla content that's coming out, whether it's 
on Netflix with the TV shows they got going on there with Gamera, Kong, Skull Island, uh, to you know the MonsterVerse is going to help all around. It's helping the IP growing the pop culture icon that Godzilla is and King Kong to a new audience, and that's that's absolutely fine. Whether you love the MonsterVerse yeah. or you love the Toho stuff, some some general audience people. If every general audience person went to go see Godzilla minus one, like they did for Godzilla versus Kong, Godzilla minus one would be at almost five hundred million dollars right now. You know, keep that yeah. in mind. Um, I was thinking, Trey, um, how much? Because you know, with Godzilla minus one hitting a little over eighty million right now. Uh, the movie Air, which is one of your favorite movies as well this year, yeah, uh, only did ninety million uh, worldwide. What was Air's budget? Oh, probably with a cast like that. Yeah, pro- probably like seventy million. Um, I don't know because it was such a intimate film, and with Ben Affleck doing the directing, acting, writing, he was probably able to keep the cost down. I just looked it up. What was it? Ninety million. 90 million for that movie yep wow. well i mean uh, it, it has a star-studied cast i'm not too surprised that it was it was obviously going to be more than godzilla minus one um but uh airs airs a great film too it is but just shows you you know like what you could do with 15 under 15 million dollars it does and 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 like Burgu said hopefully hollywood is taking notes because they got to find a way to cut down the cost to certain things uh, Mm -hmm. so that way they can actually turn a profit. um, But more importantly to, you know, make, just make good movies. Don't crank out sequels. Don't re, you know, Mm -hmm. boot IPs just so you can try to find the audience because it's the safe bet. Um, You know, it's better to create quality. I think, you know, I just saw in the chat. What's up, Tim Stock? He said, "Kaiju lives matter." And then uh, my boy read it out loud. Me responds, "I love not to shawl." <laughs> oh my god! Man, I think we're ready to start talking about. I think people uh, are ready. So, it, it, monsters. What's up, Ryan Swayze and Sean Franklin joining the chat? What's up, Sean? It's been a while, my man. Um, Crash puppet, how you doing, buddy? What's up, Crash? Uh, it's wonderful to see you guys all in the chat to talk about Monarch Legacy of Monsters episode eight. So I feel like Corey, let's. Let's just not waste let's, yeah, any let's, time. Let's just bust right into it with Birthright. Uh, as you know, we they kind of left us on a bit of a, uh, not a, so much a cliffhanger, but uh, basically letting us know that Apex cybernetics lurks in the background. They're kind of, uh, I, what I love is a lot of people have been calling it the Hydra of the MonsterVerse, you know, kind of comparing it to the MCU. And in a way, that's, yeah, that's that's kind of true, and I hope they go a little further into that because one of the things I felt like Godzilla versus Kong really suffered from was backstory. Uh, you know, just to have this apex show up out of nowhere and to not really like go into Jonah how he knows them, how he was able to sell King Ghidorah's skull to them, so that way they could do all the crazy things they were doing with it. Um, so this show is creating and filling in some of those plot holes, which is really nice to see. And it's helping the MonsterVerse become even more a greater quality universe. Even with Kong Skull Island with Bill Rando, when you realize some of the things that he's gone through in his life, it makes his loss in Kong Skull Island that much harder. And I love that so much. Um, What's Corey. up, Jamon Scruggs? He says the 50 storyline is so much better. I completely I agree. I completely that. agree, Jamon. If, if they, that's one thing they absolutely should have focused more on this season. Uh, because anytime that legacy cast is what we've been calling them, uh, anytime they show up, there, there's just something about it. It's the chemistry. The story writing is more interesting. Um, and they it, they are, just as our good friend who's been on the panel, Josh, has said, it. Both storylines have kind of mirrored each other, yet one is succeeding and one is not, uh, you know, with the post G-Day crew, the kids, you know. Um, so I think a lot of that goes to just the chemistry and the storytelling of how they're writing both storylines. The 50s legacy cast is so much, so much more um, clean in a mm. way clean clean is a, is a bit of a double word on that one because Kate Kate has made it very dirty. <laughs> 
you yeah, know, she, doing yes. that to her brother Kentaro. That's that's rough. <laughs> uh, have you saw? Have you all seen the Skull Island the anime series? I have, and I have a review on it actually. If you want to check it out, uh, it's like a quick ten minute video, just giving my generic thoughts on it. I thought it was, I thought it was a solid show. I'm a little upset that we haven't heard about a, a sequel or a season two coming in. So hopefully they get on it because they kind of left us in a weird place. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a, it was a good, good um, show. I thought you know for. At least in terms of the animated stuff they've done with Godzilla recently, I thought that was one of the better stuff in the monster verse, especially. Uh, so yeah. Um, but Corey, I loved how they started this episode because it started from a different perspective, kind of doing a callback all the way to episode two, where our legacy cast was in the car and they were driving to Kazakhstan, and it was kind of through Lee's point of view watching um Keiko and bill randa having a conversation about hiroshi why do you think they started that particular scene through his point of view oh man that's a good question um i i don't want to say like what we're going to be leading to but i think it all leads to uh what's going to be happening in the next few episodes. Uh, kind of what the thumbnail said, you know, we're going to start to see some uh, last minute um, regrets, last minute flashbacks, last minute uh, things to really build that emotions of uh, Amiko and Shaw and everything like that. So like, we're going to see, you know, their bonds, some of the, or not uh, uh, Keiko, um, uh uh we're gonna see those different tug, tugging at the pull you know the heartstrings of, of their relationship uh towards the, the, the final moments of it you know so um the what never been type uh feelings or what what could have been you know type of feelings and moments of Shaw and uh, Keiko's uh uh you know just bond and relationship uh, uh as a whole so i you know it, it's le- it's it's it, it's when i started seeing that and some of the things that later on it just kind of mm. led me to the path to the way i think the show's heading yeah I, I i agree and i think especially by focusing on his perspective and they kind of i don't know if you noticed it Corey, because i watched it again this morning but like the image starts off clear and then it keeps getting, you know, the, the surroundings keep getting cloudy, almost like if it is a memory kind of going through his mind. But I also wonder if it's kind of just to, to kind of give us a little emotion of what's going on in his mind as well, to kind of give us like mm-hmm. maybe a little regret, the anger of like not being her one, you know, if, you know, hit, you know, them actually coming together. But there was a lot of callbacks throughout the entire season of certain things that if, you, if you're really paying attention to some of the things they were saying to each other, it really kind of comes either full circle or it helps explain why things happened the way they did. Uh, you know, especially when you saw Shaw and Keiko, they really seem to have the blossoming relationship, especially at the ball that, you know, they were actually going to be very intimate with each other at one point, but a certain event happens when they lose the control over Monarch to Lieutenant uh, Hash, Hash, is it? Hatch, Hatch, um, you know, that it, it really starts to separate them. Uh, so I think the fact that he's kind of, <laughs> in a weird way right just where we left off with the last episode with the post g-day crew with kentaro seeing kate and may's relationship starting to blossom and seeing the regret on his face now you're kind of seeing it in the same aspect of sean watching bill and keiko uh so once again just as we saw with the opening credits the mirroring of each other um but i love how it immediately transitions to uh the older shaw the kurt russell shaw who's obviously she's on his mind he's thinking about her because we talked about this during our watch party Corey. this particular mission we know is shaw's trying to close up all the hollow earth portals so that way titans can't get out and they're kind of imprisoned in their realm in the hollow earth and that's how he's helping Godzilla, right? So Godzilla really doesn't have to protect us anymore. Godzilla can kind of just rest and leave us alone. We see that 
his mission is personal, you know, because in the very first episode, we saw that we lost Keiko uh, to those uh, endo swarmers that, you know, pulled her down into the hollow earth portal. And, you know, to him, th this is that mission of where he's going to Kazakhstan to literally blow up that portal to kind mm -hmm. of, clear up uh some of that regret uh but you're starting to see that Duvall is wondering about his motivations you know his in like why is he why does it have to be this location uh so she's already starting to have doubts about what his true motivations do you think that's gonna come uh, to be a bigger complication between Duvall and Shaw at some point Corey in the show yeah I think it's possible um yeah, I, I I have some thoughts that I want to dive deeper into when we bring up some other things of that that portion of the story. But yeah, I think, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it, it may. Okay, okay. I was I was curious to see if if you ever think at some point uh, they they try to do a mutiny on each other. You know, essentially because I don't different... think it'll be a mutiny. I think she may like. I, no, I don't. I don't even know if she'll question it personally. You're kind of thinking about it a little bit more. I, I think she's in with Shaw, so she's in with Shaw all the way. Okay. Yep. Um. Interesting. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious what uh, if the chat's talking about that at all as well. Um. But Corey, go ahead and go to the next slide. So obviously, you know, it's a personal one. We go through the opening credits, and as you guys know, I like to kind of keep the timeline separate a little bit, not to do the flashbacks like they did. And they did a really wonderful job, Corey, I felt like with this particular episode of like when a certain scene would happen and using a transition that would like, you know, if an elevator opened, it would be the next cast, you know, or I love similar that, situations. You I know, I thought it was so very much. brilliant cinematography and the use of kind of explaining the different timelines. Um, it's just one thing they've been able to do very, very well with this show. And I thought this particular episode, anytime you get the, you know, legacy cast, I'm all about it. Um, I love what uh, Javon says in man's ignorance and trying to control nature and trying to close the portals is so different. Every time they try to so destroy or contain the times it backfires badly for humans. Yeah. Uh, as we were talking about in our watch party, right? You have like a, like a balloon if you started like popping little holes that was filled with water and it like to the very, like it was filled with water, right? Where it's, it's very, it's almost like fully pressurized to where if you poke holes and the water starts to come out and then you plug it up, it's going to try to find a hole somewhere else, you know, because the pressure is building up. And if you do it too many times, all of a sudden it's going to explode. Right. And I think that's what it's leading to is the consequences mm -hmm. that Shaw doesn't realize his actions are going to have, that Hollow Earth really can't be contained, you know. I disagree. It oh, really? You think you think they're going to be able to lock oh, up? No, What's I, up, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I disagree with with Monarch's uh, take on that. You know, like they're they're trying to play it off. Like like I get I get the experiment that you're saying, Trey. Like that you fill a balloon up with water, you poke holes in it. And, you know, if you cover it up, it's going to start, you know, pushing out more. <laughs> it's, it's like that <laughs> classic uh, cartoon, you know, where you see, like, the thing trying to, the, the boat is filling with water and you start, like, plugging it, you know, and the water just keeps finding ways to come through because you're just pressurizing it, you know? Yes, but um, do we know that's how it works? You know, like, the portals haven't been played around with that much. It's relatively a newer concept. Yes, uh uh, Shaw probably has the most experience with the portal, so I have a tendency to lean towards what Shaw thinks about uh, the way to get rid of the portals. But two, uh, Monarch's excuse of saying, hey, all the, um, you know, we're seeing uh, activity over here, more activity over here after he blew up uh, the portal, that, that, that that's not entirely true because Alaska was a hot point. Because uh, before he blew up the portal. So they, they were seeing um, gamma activity off the charts in Alaska and stuff like that mm. prior to him blowing stuff up. So, you know, like, yeah, sure. There, to me, there's a lot of stuff moving around. And I'm kind of curious about 
uh, blowing these portals up. Like, I, I'd like to see it play out more. Like, I hope we blow up more portals. <laughs> you want you want to see it happen uh, even more? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as we learned uh, eventually uh, that while Shaw's doing all this, you know, closing up the hollow earth portals, the other ones are increasing in gamma ray energy, which could be interesting because it could encourage maybe more Titans to come out as it's you know becoming more powerful, it's more enticing for them to leave uh, and cause havoc. So it could, like I've seen some people say, it could piss off Godzilla because right now it is somewhat balanced. And if we're messing around with that, Godzilla may you know be you know just kind of how he was with uh, Godzilla versus Kong, where he wasn't happy that we were messing around with Mecha Godzilla. So he was like, "I'm shutting this down." Um, very interesting, indeed. Um, but as we follow the legacy cast, uh, they have a debriefing with Lieutenant Hatch, who is now the head of Monarch. And we know he he has uh, a different um, motivation of, you know, he has different uh, incentives of what he's trying to achieve with Monarch. He thinks Monarch's a waste of time and they just need to be shut down. It's a waste of, you know, funds. We need to start preparing for the Cold War and fighting Russia and building weapons and things like that. He's very much your old dog military man. And as he's getting his debrief from the trio, the legacy cast, and he's basically saying, like, this is just theories, myths. This is this is nothing to go off of. You guys are just giving me useless information here. Uh, oh, Corey, go go back one. Um, so Lieutenant Hatch is, you know, obviously he's he's just trying to shut it down. But you can also see in that time frame right shortly after world war ii this guy definitely has an opinion and a perspective on japan and japanese people and it makes sense because of you know shortly after pearl harbor all of the concentration camps that we built mm -hmm. uh in the u.s you know it was not a great time but you have to understand after the tragedy of pearl harbor it makes sense why some people reacted the way they did mm -hmm. and there was that hatred war does not sometimes create the best out of people so his bigotry makes sense as him as a character but uh, i love personally as he's kind of really almost egging them on to do something you know it the one who takes the swing Corey, is bill randa were you surprised shaw didn't go for it this time no um hmm. no uh, I, I go back and forth um, because this guy is Navy, right? Uh, I believe, or was he Army as well? Like, I can't remember. I think he was Navy, if I recall. Yeah, um, which it's very possible, you know, Navy, Navy and Army don't get along too, too well. So Shaw, Shaw could have, could have decked him, but I think in some ways Shaw also understands, um, you know, he's a little bit more military minded, you know, it's not like they're at a bar, you know, they're, um, you know that there there's protocols in the military and everything like that and i think in some ways you know um shaw you know he he always seems to like he ha seems like he has something up his sleeve as well mm. so um while he's saying he, he could be thinking oh he's fallen right into you know my plan you know he's i'm, I'm gonna make a play on him now so this is this is gonna work out yeah in the long run for me so we, we shaw, do see shaw kind of sean's able to i think what's great about chess bro yeah i think what he's great about he's able to predict because he is a military guy he knows mm -hmm. how these guys think you know but he also has i think he's he's been hanging around some very smart people lately and i think uh just as I think, yeah, the butler said he probably learned his lesson the first round with the general pocket uh, when he lost control of Monarch. And he realizes, you know, I have to kind of do what Keiko asked me to do, which was sometimes I'm going to have to make the decision that maybe they don't agree with, you know, his his team, but it's going to save Monarch in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so he's going to have to play that that kind of that gray area. He was going to have to make some hard decisions. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, Corey. I think he was able to foresee what uh, Lieutenant Hatch was going to present to General Puckett before the budget meeting to see, you know, what funds they were going to give. Because he he knew he had the ace in his pocket, you know, with Godzilla returning and that the H-bomb did nothing to destroy Godzilla back at Castle Bravo. Um, as TJ says, I was more surprised Randa did because 
that proved to Keiko who actually loved her. That decision cemented her legacy with Randa. You know, I, I think the, their love is different, right? I think in a way, and and I'll tell you why. Uh, the actor who plays Bill Randa did an interview actually talking about the relationship and the difference between Shaw and Bill when it comes to Keiko. And he was kind of saying that Shaw and Keiko kind of had a, a love of passion and attraction, you know, that they they were interested in each other, but their their paths was very in conflict of each other because of their roles in Monarch, wow. you know, and that's what separated them. But when it comes to Bill Randa and Keiko and why their relationship started to blossom is the simple fact that they he, as he put it, the actor did, they fell in love with their work and their work was very much the same, right? The, mm. What they were passionate about was the same. So they kind of fell in love with their work, which made them trust each other. And as that's a callback to that episode, I think episode five, where Keiko says to Shaw, you know, or Shaw says first to Keiko, he's just like, you don't trust me. And Keiko says, I don't trust either of us. How long is it going to be before one of us has to make the decision that hurts the other, but is the best thing for Monarch or is the best thing for me? You know, I can't trust when we're going to make the right call because of our you know relationship, our love for each other. But as Randa says to Keiko, I trust you, you know, and she trusts him back. So that trust in their work and their passion for their work is kind of where their love blossomed, which I think it did turn into real love, but I, I don't think it was in the same manner that of how Sean Keiko loved each other. I think there's always going to be that little bit of that pain, kind of the first love, I guess you could say. Uh, Corey, actually, what's your thoughts about that now that I talk about that callback? Yeah, I, I think you're, I, I think we're both kind of spot on. You know, I think we both agree that Shaw, you know, being the military guy, had a larger plan at play, more strategy going on. And uh, the way that you explained uh, Randa and Keiko's love, um, that, yeah, that just makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. So obviously, at this moment, <laughs> Shaw knows Monarch is in a bit of a bind that Lieutenant Hatch is not going to go back to General Puckett with something that's going to be good for Monarch. It's going to be shut down if he doesn't do something. So he he kind of continues on and says, make me a map. Make me basically a file of all of our information that there are Titans out there. I have the ace in the hole with Godzilla to keep us funding, you know, to keep this organization alive long enough, uh, you know, to, to keep us around. So he has uh keiko and randa build this map that we've now seen has been really filled out we kind of see the creation of it uh with all their knowledge about the titans but more importantly how they start to develop their hollow earth idea and of course once again this is that love and passion that bill randa and keiko start to develop because they really work together on this and as you see with that one shot with shaw he's listening in and he kind of he realizes it's very similar to to Kentaro, right? Where he's kind of realizing it's not his girl anymore. You know, it's starting to become Bill Randa's. And we see what that becomes a, a little bit of regret, but uh, Shaw obviously had kind of respected the relationship just as Bill Randa did for him when their relationship was kind of blossoming together. Um, Corey, go ahead and go to the next slide. So now, uh, Obviously, as Bill Randa is starting to figure it out. And I loved how they explained this, Corey. Wasn't this like such a cool thing mm -hmm. to have the ant like rolling around yes. on the map and it goes through a rip in the hole and is inside? And that's that is the creation of his whole theory about Hollow Earth and how brilliant of a way to kind of like it makes sense. It didn't come out of nowhere. It's it was something that was very natural and organic mm. in matter and in a way he kind of foreshadowing right it's this insect which we'll see later on going through in and out of hollow earth uh which leads him to uh surprise keiko to tell her about his big discovery about hollow earth which he then learns her big surprise is that and to <laughs> all of our surprises we all were predicting that maybe shaw was hiroshi's true father uh, and they even kind of joked about it in the show, which broke my heart because as soon as they joked about it before this big reveal, 
I knew that it was like, okay, well, that's not going to be it because they would have saved that for this moment. Um, but the big surprise is, is that uh, Keiko is a widow in that she had a child with that man. Um, and that's where Hiroshi, he's, he's, a, uh, I guess not. I mean, he's, his father is gone, you know, so there's no secret of who's his father, Bill Randor, Lee Shaw. He, he had another dad that um, unfortunately didn't survive from World War II, I believe is what they said, right, Corey? Is that what they're uh, kind of leaning towards as I think well? that's, that's what they're leading to. Too. I think he, he was lost in World War II, mm -hmm. which also could explain why Lieutenant Hatch was also kind of uh, not yeah. too trusting of Keiko and her intentions because he even kind of says, like, you know, we need to worry about infiltration from the inside, you know, the, the communists from the inside of our government and our country you know and kind of referring that like keiko is going to be a traitor to the u.s which was uncalled for right um uh, well i mean it, obviously something that we did see in the cold war yeah. right? there there were uh, but, the traitors for sure but keiko was but easily not one of them she also but she uh, I, I i don't know if we could completely say that because uh she, like she, I mean, she's not a traitor in this like the grand scheme of things of uh um, you know, like war things, but she's definitely looking out more for Monarch and protecting the Kaijus, which it, it, in some ways could be a, and, a, a traitorous view of in the military's somebody, eyes. The military's yeah, absolutely. Eyes. Yeah. yeah. With some of these old dogs, they, they mm -hmm. haven't quite grasped on the concept that Godzilla in particular mm -hmm. has a natural balance to the world that yeah. they can't, um, that the government's not willing to see yet, you know, as, and it, it, it's a callback too, when it comes to a character like Sarazawa, who kind of always said like Godzilla's the balance, right? He will restore the balance to earth. And, you know, even King of the Monsters, he says that, uh, which is why Godzilla was pissed off in Godzilla versus Kong, right? Because Mecha Godzilla threw off the balance of the earth and the Titans. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very much, uh, I love that, we're keeping those elements of the monster verse, especially when it comes to who Godzilla is as a character rather than just a Titan, you know, or just this monster mm -hmm. thing. But um, this is really the moment where their relationship blossoms because he's telling her uh, in a very geeky way. I love that Bill Rand is kind of able to, to, to still add this, like, <laughs> I'm not going to say it because I'm too weird about it. He's kind of socially awkward, right? Um, and he's just like, we, we got your back, you know, like you don't have to raise this kid alone that we're here for you. Uh, and it's that moment where you realize Keiko feels like she can truly trust Randa, yeah. which is kind of the, the start of their relationship, um, which was like really a sweet moment. But then we get Shaw who meets up unannounced with general Puckett. and general Puckett obviously doesn't want to meet with Shaw, but, uh, as, uh, he pulls out his ace and tells him, hey, Lieutenant Hatch has kind of withheld information from you. So not only is that going to piss off General Puckett to yeah. kind of throw Lieutenant Hatch under the bus, but to be like, Godzilla's still alive and that H-bomb didn't kill him. You can immediately see that General Puckett is like on Team Shaw again, you know, and it was very smart of Shaw while Keiko told him don't say Godzilla's still alive because they're just going to build another big weapon right he knew that was the only thing that was going to be able to save Monarch but he uses it to her advantage right he says you need to understand that this was done with the loyalty of Keiko and Randa that they they wanted you to know this information so he saved Monarch right he's doing the very thing that Keiko said how long is it going to be before one of us has to make a decision that goes against our personal wishes or, you know, goes for helping monarchs in, in a way he did what she asked, because what have you done at that one episode at the end of there where he's like, okay, I'm going to go do it now. And, in you know, Corey, do you think I've heard some people say in social media that, uh, Shaw didn't do it so much to protect monarch, but did it as a screw you to Keiko and Randa because uh, he realized their relationship was over. Do you think it was some jealousy that he told General Puckett uh, about Godzilla without the team really approving that? No, no, uh, he had to, in my opinion, and uh, it's it's honestly what um, I wanted uh, a few episodes ago when we first saw this uh, new admiral or guy take over. Uh, we, we wanted to see Shaw fight for Monarch, and. Um, um, 
sure he could have showed him the map like oh yeah he didn't show you all these and different things but there is nothing that was going to connect to the general more than telling him that godzilla's still alive and uh he's like how do you know for sure he's like i saw him with my own eyes you know when i left because i you know got this information that he might be still alive you know we wanted those vibes and that you know message translated to him so um it it, it uh like terry kelly or nine lives and how here says uh it was really his only options he beyond the night says he had to do it so um yeah yeah shaw had to fight for monarch and had to somewhat try to take control of what, what what's going on yeah, he, he had to be a professional rather than a uh, dude in love with Keiko, mm -hmm. you know, and and like uh, um, Oracle's Clock Tower said, you know, Shaw is being what Keiko asked him to be, you know, the mm -hmm. protector. You know, he said, my job is to protect you. And she said, no, your job is to protect Monarch. And this is what he do it. You know what he's doing. He's trying to protect Monarch. And that's where it kind of ends with with our legacy cast. You know, it's kind of the idea that shaw shaw did it right he was able to keep monarch going at least a little bit longer um mm -hmm. we don't know exactly what happens after keiko's disappearance uh you know when she falls into that hollow earth portal uh in kazakhstan but hopefully that is answered in the next episode that kind of gives us an idea of how bill and shaw go about raising hiroshi and what what happens when shaw enters hollow earth you know it, there's a lot of questions going on there for well, sure it seems to me like uh this episode um it, it, well it obviously uh, you know left on a major cliffhanger for the legacy cast as well you know like um there's a lot of things that are going on and hopefully i think like you said these uh i think some of these answers are going to be on uh the next episode as well this is like going to be a part two in the next episode that's how i see it yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think uh, episode nine is really going to ramp up the finale, but mm -hmm. is also just going to get answer a lot of questions we've been having. I don't think we'll get Apex much again. I know a lot of people are hoping like, oh, this is the big bad now. I, I don't know if there is going to be so much a big bad. I think, I think in a weird way, Shaw kind of is the big bad and I, I don't mean that as, as he's wrong is that a lot of great villains are kind of conflicting right like their goals are you can see like the logic in a lot of their goals sometimes because the villain the villain never thinks they're the villain they think they're the hero and shaw very much seems that way where he thinks he's the hero and he could he very well could i know a lot of us don't want it to be because we love shaw and i know what i still love shaw even though it seems like his mission his goal is a bit flawed and that it's not going to turn out the way he wants it to be but uh you know he's he's trying to stop another g day right he's tired of the data driven monarch and you know, he doesn't want to see another San Francisco. Now we know in Godzilla King of the Monsters, it gets even worse than San Francisco. So he's not 100% wrong uh, in what he tried to achieve there. Um, Crash the Purple Puppet says, I want more Apex. I, I It'd be cool. I think if they want to do more Apex, save it for season two. Let let Apex be the, the, the crazier theme. Uh, but as we get now, Corey, go ahead and go to our next slide. Now that we are with our post g day crew timeline uh i really loved just kind of we you know the whole episode is called birthright and it's wonderful that like with the post g day crew it really felt like that this is now their legacy you know they're really getting heavily involved what's up kaylin uh kaylin says i believe keiko is still alive i just have the feeling she really is and yesterday apple tv released a little clip of godzilla versus the ion dragon with his atomic breath do you guys uh, did you guys see it I I have seen the trailer that uh, the you know I think it was the mid season trailer I haven't seen the new clip uh, of the Ion Dragon if if they added something extra but uh, I think you're right I think you know as our thumbnail says on you know for today's show Keiko is alive question mark question mark question mark uh, we're definitely gonna talk about that in a second so Kaylin stick around because I would love to hear your thoughts about why you especially think Keiko is alive. Um, but like I said, uh, Corey, you know, it was great to kind of see uh, 
the legacy now, right? Like as Tim has really kind of become the mentor to these kids and Tim is amazing. Love Tim. Tim is a goat for sure. Um, you know, I just loved like when he answers like, Wel welcome to your legacy. And you see all these photos and they're like, well, aren't we royalty? Like aren't our parents, grandparents, the, the founders of this. And you start to realize, well, <sighs> Just like with all things, sometimes things are corrupted, especially when it, things kind of get outlandish, right? And the fact that Bill Randa really became obsessed with the hollow earth theory, and it was just so hard for the government to believe it. They're like, dude, you're a tinfoil guy. Like, you're just, and you see that in Kong Skull Island, right, Corey? It's a callback mm. where these, uh, the senator is just like, I'll give you a couple of minutes, but, and he's just like, well, what is this, a tinfoil hat thing? Like, and it, he's kind of silly poking uh, jokes and making fun of uh, Bill Randa, John Goodman's version in the beginning of Kong Skull Island. Um, I, I just thought that was so friends are right. Right? Yeah. The, the conspiracy, which has kind of been interesting. You see Godzilla versus Kong really says the conspiracy theorists are right uh, um, in, you know, um, Kong Skull Island with Bill Randa and, uh, uh Aaron, uh, is it Dr. Aaron Howard Aaron, something mm, like that? Uh, no, Hawks, something yeah. like that. Um, Corey, or maybe I'm thinking his name is Corey Hawkins. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Uh, Howard Brooks, it's Brooks. Sorry, Dr. Mm. Brooks, uh, is the one. Uh, let's see. I can't wait for the Iron Dragon versus guys. I think Kate's alive too, or uh, Ke Keiko, Keiko, yeah. Um, I agree, guys. It seems a lot of people are starting to to think she is alive, but uh, you know, of course, the, the mission is like, well, where where is uh shaw going how we we need to stop him from doing this because monarch is seeing the gamma rays after he destroyed the alaskan uh hollow earth portal that it has jumped and skyrocketed all the other hollow earth portals so it's that idea right like be, by closing one he could be setting off a chain reaction that could cause a further problem for earth it could i don't know implode it so it could who knows? Or maybe it just awakens all the Titans who get pissed off and creates more hollow earth portals than they can handle. And you're going to cause a big problem for Godzilla. Uh, it would it would be interesting. I kind of hope that they show, uh, you know, just as Godzilla King of the Monsters kind of showed when um, Jonah and his team were awakening King Ghidorah. You could tell Godzilla was aware and he was pissed off and he was trying to, as Michael Doherty said, he was trying to let Monarch, when he swims by uh, Castle Bravo, uh, to let him know that, like, hey, something's going down. I'm going to need your help, you know? Um, so it would be interesting to kind of have Godzilla involved in that, like kind of seeing like how he's reacting to some of these things going on. Um, because, as I've said, one thing that I've worried about with the MonsterVerse especially now that you've had a character like Kong in it who can communicate with humans is I'm worried that they don't think Godzilla is completely like a, a character that can drive a story, which we've seen in this monster verse. Like there's elements where Godzilla is highly intelligent and it's even talked about in, at the very end of this episode of just how intelligent Godzilla is. And I hope that they use that to their advantage to not just make him the giant savior or, you know, destroying cities, you know, helping people, but he, he has personality, right? He's laughing at Kong. He Godzilla can actually be a character. I don't want him talking or sign languaging, but like, I think you can show a lot with Godzilla's eyes just as they did in one of the previous episodes for sure. Corey, what do, what do you think about that? You know, especially, Godzilla not just being a mindless creature. I know they kind of brought it up with this, but I, I would, would yeah. you like to see kind of how yeah. Godzilla is reacting to this situation? Yeah. You know, in the monster verse, I'm okay with the idea that Godzilla is more of the guardian versus the terror side of things. So yeah. I would like to see more um, of Godzilla and, you know, like, you know, it'd be freaking awesome if we saw all oh, bro. I, we need some more of that. We need to see Godzilla perspective, Godzilla view, you know, like some some more like some point of view, of, you know. Yeah, POV inside the head of Godzilla, you know. Yeah. Uh, can I mean, get into inside the mind of Godzilla? That'd be something as awesome. simple as you know when you, Shaw closes the Hollow Earth portal. As soon as you show that, cut to a scene to Godzilla where he feels it, he senses it, you know, and how is he reacting? Is is there, I mean, I don't know if Godzilla would ever be nervous, but like to give 
the idea of, you know, like, what, is he starting to get a little panicked? You know, like, is there something that he needs, feels like he has to do? That way you can really start to hone in on the character that G-Man is, you know? Uh, wait, Godzilla lapped a Kong win? Yeah, in Godzilla versus Kong, when Godzilla hits the atomic breath on Kong and it hits his back in Hong Kong and Kong falls to the ground, you, Godzilla like chuckles. Like he literally, they zoom up on his face and you hear Godzilla going like, ha 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 kind of in a more monstrous way but like you see godzilla smile he's very much a personality just like kong you know uh who doesn't want more gojira i, I agree right you know? and he doesn't want more uh um godzilla drop kicks as well you know <laughs> yeah so but I, yeah, that would i'd be down for that you know if godzilla wants to just fly around yeah i'm just kidding uh it looks like we're gonna <laughs> uh it, it looks like uh we are going to get some more outlandish action with godzilla kong the new empire uh with them running around so i mean it looks fun right it looks like it's gonna be a crazy film uh more drop kicks by godzilla would be can, nice as well can i ask you a question uh because yeah. this uh this uh uh picture that you brought up um you know, kind of had me thinking a little bit, and I thought about it in the show, but I didn't say it out loud. Yeah. Um, Monarch knows what um, Apex is, right? Um, who knows? They, uh, my, my guess is, based off um, Michael Chandler's character in mm -hmm. um, Godzilla vs. Kong, it does not seem Monarch is aware Okay. of what apex is, is doing is monarch aware of the company that may works for because they they clearly knew that uh she was in trouble with this company do does do you think monarch knows that company that she's worked for like it, like it seemed to me like tim kind of knew what was going on when they went to rescue may or cora um my guess is they don't for the simple okay. fact that Monarch has stayed kind of in the shadows. And I think, you know, as, as Shaw has mm. said, you know, with them being so data driven and kind of just focusing and, you know, just doing their information. The only part where I could see maybe they are somewhat aware of that company is uh, w when the San Francisco event happened and Monarch started to try to, figure out how they could create safety measures you know with technology yeah. i i could see that company being contracted by monarch to okay. do some of those you things. think apex may be contracted by monarch eventually i think okay. eventually they'll definitely be contracted by monarch so that you know kind of keep your enemies close and i don't mean that through the standpoint of monarch i think monarch as bad as it sounds is kind of oblivious to what's going on in the human realm of things Mm -hmm. um, with the Titans, they're, you know, they're keeping track, right? But I think they're kind of close-minded with, like, what are humans doing? What problems are they causing? Because really the only human that really caused a problem for Monarch that we were aware of before Shaw was Jonah and his eco-terrorist yeah. team uh, that was releasing or capturing all these different yeah. Titans um, sure. and selling them on the black market, you know? For sure. The reason why I bring it up, it, it just seems to me like the modern day Monarch crew is a bunch of idiots running around with their heads cut off. You know, like it's, uh, uh, it, it, they're, they're kind of like all over the place. They, you know, like they, they, they're, they're not as, you know, like, and, and maybe, maybe it's just because the legacy cast is just so tight knit and there's only so many of them where Monarch's this big, huge thing now. Um, like it kind of bothers me that, you know, they, you know, you know, and I know again that there's a plot to have it, but like, why is May allowed to go in with the Randa kids and everything like that? You know, like she's technically just a civilian, you know, and you know, how much stuff yeah. do you want her to to really know and see and stuff? I, like I think that? it's one of those scenes, the fact that she's kind of been involved in the situation mm -hmm. and she is useful in her hacking skills, her computer skills. Uh, and so she, Monarch wouldn't be. I mean, apparently not that good because May was able to find shit that they weren't able to find, you know? Mm. So I, I think they do see that ability to utilize. And also May has proven that she can stay undercover, you know? She can she can go, she can disappear, you know? And I think for Monarch at this time, 
uh, which I will say the one thing I was a little sad they didn't go into a little bit with this episode was Mm -hmm. the deputy director just announced that Monarch is a thing. You know, they, they just revealed themselves to the world and we didn't see how the world reacted to that. You Mm -hmm. know, I feel like that would have been big news. Like there would be an outcry and an outrage against Monarch, you know, because civilians being like, you serious? Like you, you knew about these scenes and you didn't tell us, you know, like there was no warning, you know, and you guys are the cause of San Francisco, which yes, we do kind of see that hearing uh, from the government with Godzilla King of the Monsters, but I would have expected an immediate kind of action to be taken, you know, something, something to go down rather than it just being like, Hey, we exist. And then let's continue our work. Yeah. You know, I, I would have liked to see more into that as well, but like, the thing that lives kind of rent free in the back of my mind still is, you know, we're thinking Kate, or excuse me, May, Cora, probably took the deal and is spying is now spying on Monarch. Is kind of how we're, how I feel at least. Is that how you feel after the previous episode too, Trey? I think she's undecided. <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think she's keeping it as an option. You know, she's a survivalist, just as that that lady said. You know, you're a survivor. Uh, and there's she's... no way they would have let her go, though. They had her in their grip. There's no way they would have let her go if she didn't take him up on that offer. It certainly seems like she did. I don't know if that. I don't. And this is why I think they're planning a season two, mm. and May is clearly going to be kind of a a wild card in that season two because. When there's too much going on for Apex to jump back into this show and be the central focus. But I think she's going to be used to kind of be the corruption within Monarch, the traitors, the spies, you know, so that Apex can really kind of be the the big bad at mm-hmm. some point in this show. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Oracle's Clock Tower, for reminding people to, to do this special thing. Corey, you know what to do. Mm, yeah, you guys all need to subscribe like this. Godzilla! 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 <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. So. <laughs> one of, one of the best moments in Godzilla Millennium, you know? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Crash. I appreciate it, guys. It, it's great to see you. And, and share. If you haven't shared the stream, get all of your friends into the chat because the more people we have, the more fun the conversation is, for sure, mm-hmm. because some of you guys are bringing up some some really great points about this episode. But because of this whole uh, discussion that they have uh, and looking through some of Tim's files, and there's so many great little callbacks in that, right, Corey? L- little references where they're like, Tim keeps everything, right? He doesn't throw anything away to where they find an exterminator bill, you know, for the ants that were in Bill Randa's office because it's the same office, right? Because we see the the, mm-hmm. the fist print in the wall from when Randa hit the wall because he was so pissed off and supposedly broke his hand, which is hilarious. Um, but they learn that Keiko, their grandmother, uh, Kate and her uh, Kentaro's grandmother, died on a mission and was but well it says missing right Corey? it says missing in action it doesn't actually said dead right so which kind of starts to reveal that bill and possibly lee shaw never quite gave up hope which might explain why bill randa especially in kong skull island became even more obsessed about hollow earth and wondering how to you know to maybe how to get there right to maybe see if keiko is still alive you know, it yeah, could like, really explain him. Maybe Operation Hourglass, it was like what we said, they're going to look, it was really a, they're going to look for uh, Keiko, but end up, you know, turning back, you know, that, that, that time for themselves a little bit, found of youth style. So they ended up naming it Operation Hourglass, but the, the purpose of the mission was to find Keiko, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um which uh like uh um kaiju crazy craig ron says it makes his story more heartbreaking in kong skull island with uh bill randa yeah it it's just filling in some of those gaps that make it like really really um impactful like you realize there's so much more to bill randa than there was before so i dig that yeah 
Um, it's funny. Trey and I joked about this uh, uh, during the uh, watch party. You know, what if Keiko is alive and they show up in the new Empire? You know, with Randa, who's or not Randa, but <clears throat> with Shaw, who stays back with her. As much as I would love that idea, just because I I always hate it when they make a spinoff TV show that never like connects back to the movie. Like I always like a little nod, right? Like for me, Jurassic World Dominion, for a great example, why they never like gave a little nod or reference to the Camp Cretaceous group. I don't know. Will always like make me scratch my head. Like might as well to expand this universe to give those fans who have been sticking with all of your IP content to give them a little tip of the hat to say mm-hmm. thank you for watching. You know your world exists, um, and hopefully we, we are seeing that with a a lot of nods and references to some of the MonsterVerse films, right? But I would love to see the Monster film, MonsterVerse film, Godzilla Kong: The New Empire, do the same for monarch legacy of monsters i think that would be great honestly uh oh see crash is even like i love camp cretaceous dude me too i'm so excited for chaos theory that's gonna be awesome coming out sometime next year i don't know when but i'm just glad we're getting more uh so stick around for that eventually we'll talk about that show when it comes out um but because of this learning what happens in kazakhstan uh with her grandmother Kate is able to put two and two in what she knows of Shaw that, okay, this is a personal mission for him. You know, he's, he, this is going to be his next place. Uh, and it's because she was able to pick up on some of those scenes, Corey, that, you know, Shaw loved mm. her grandmother uh, and still does in a way. It still means something to him. Uh, and that she starts to realize this mission is all for her essentially to, to make up for those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love that it sends them on this path to to get there. And man, it's already a creepy scene. I'm loving it. I, I love just how they're kind of building the tension when they enter that room. And you see Tim, you know, saying like the radiation levels are not as high as they should be. That means something is absorbing them, which is, you know, just as what we would expect because of Janjira with the nuclear plant in Japan when the Mudo or the Jinshumushi uh, started absorbing and cocooned itself around that nuclear plant to absorb the radiation. So it's just, once again, I love that they're continuing kind of some of the continuity, right, of the of the Titans. And you even start to see that uh, endo swarmer um, exoskeleton. So you know whatever was once in there is turned into something far more terrifying and scary and brutal. And it's all building to this moment to where we get uh, the group back together. They find hollow the hollow earth portal they find Duvall and her team and of course our boy shaw back into the mix of it and i love that shaw was immediately like we're gonna talk he's the big dog on the hill right he's just like but i'm only gonna talk with kate Corey. why in particular do you think shaw doesn't want to include kentaro in this moment with kate i mean he does kind of explain it but i feel like they're family now, right? Kate and Kentaro, they're they're kind of building a brother and sister relationship. And in a way, the, you could say Shaw kind of looks at them as grandkids because of who Hiroshi is to him. So why why wasn't Kentaro allowed to be a part of this conversation? I think uh, in some ways it's kind of easy. Uh, Kentaro has gone against Shaw once already that we've seen, you know, in Alaska. Uh, he thought it was better to go off a, another direction. Um, so Kentaro is a little bit <clears throat> strong-minded uh, as well. Um, but I also think in some ways um, he's seen Kate flip-flop back and forth uh, a few times now, um, going back and forth uh, with her. Um, so I, I think uh, he in some ways may think that she may be a little bit easier um, to manipulate a little bit, but I'm also loving what I'm seeing in the chat as well, which uh, Kaiju Crazy Craig Rowland says Kate reminds him of Keiko as well, which um, is also another very good point. Um, so in some ways, you know, Kate at least you know went on, went with him on Alaska. You know, yes, she's kind of turned her back on him now, but she has you know gone back and forth, kind of understanding. Shaw's mission. So I think in some ways he knows that she's the one easiest 
to uh, kind of bring back to his side or at least help her understand what um, what he's trying to do. Because Kentaro, he, he's kind of given us the vibes that he's given up a while ago, you know, like he's gone off on his own and then, uh, you know, he gave up on his dad real quick, you know, and kind of kind of left in that sense. So he's kind of taken like that backseat approach where um, Kate, you know, she at least is trying to do something and try to be involved. But uh, I think uh, he's just trying to bring bring her back on his side. Yeah. Plus, if you, plus being one-on-one, you can't have Kentaro in there or May in there to try to manipulate, like, like say something or pr- like, like have another person try to say, I'll call Shaw on his bullshit. You know what I'm saying, Trey? Like, yeah. It just went on one with somebody. It, it's easier to kind of bring you over to, to, to my side, you know, certainly. I mean, and he's a very imposing kind of figure, right? Like, mm-hmm. and I, I personally, for performance wise, I really love the scene just of how Kurt Russell handle it because like when he does that that thing where he just looks at he's like believe me please believe me like you can tell that it's been hard on the dude like you know he is constantly has tried to get people to understand his fears and like what he knows is coming like we know he has wonderful foresight right he was able to plan what lieutenant hatch was gonna do and counteract to that so that way he could get monarch back in top and back in possession right and it, he's doing the same thing, right? He's and calculating. nobody knows the inner secrets more than Shaw. No, Shaw knows everything about Monarch. Exactly. Um, I do love what uh, the Batman who laughs says here. Uh, he says she is the only one that has experienced G Day firsthand and could understand his mission. Right? Like she's seen loss. K- yeah. uh, Kentaro hasn't really experienced loss. And yet, you know, and neither he's May. All the connection that her and Godzilla had. Which so, was why I I loved that, right? Like, I love going back to that. That Godzilla, he's like, you saw him. He's not just a destroyer. You know, he he knows what he's doing. You know, when you look to his eyes, you know there is something there. There's there's a soul, right? There is a there's an intelligent being who's able to think and not just eat, sleep, you know, go home. He's actually yeah. serving a purpose to the balance of the world. And as he kind of says, I believe Godzilla is here to protect us from, you know, getting in and from things that are getting out. He's keeping the balance in order, which is setting up all the things that, you know, could really come up to be a, a major problem because she even brings up to him saying like, hey, but if you continue on this path, there's consequences, Shaw. Like, they're seeing that if you continue to close the portals, the gamma rays are getting stronger and stronger. We don't know what's going to happen when it gets to a point of unsafe, you know, limits of that gamma ray where it could cause a, a huge natural impact where you, you, you may be trying to help Godzilla, but in the end you, you may make it worse for Godzilla. Um, and I, and I love that because he, he kind of says, well, you know, it's some, it's, it's just typical monarch, only picking the data that they want to. You know, he's had enough. He's a man of action, which is very much the difference between him and Keiko and Bill Randa. Mm. And the fact that he's just like, the, the time for analyzing and thinking about what we're doing has ended. It is now a time of action, which mm. could be Shaw's downfall in the end. You know, we'll see, though. He might he may be 100% right on this, but something tells me Shaw is is leading us to a place where he may he may have had really really great intentions of protecting and not trying to cause another San Francisco G Day, but it it could it could backfire on him. I, I, I disagree. I, I think Shaw <laughs> is in the the right uh, is going on the right path. I just think he won't be able to accomplish his mission fully because he goes a different route. Interesting. Uh, and go into that, Corey. What, what what do you mean by that? I I think are are we ready to get into kind of the conspiracy theory side of things? Okay. Well, if you if you're wanting to get into that, let's let's hold off. But let's let's okay. go ahead and go to our our final slide. Obviously, when uh, Shaw sets off the the countdown timer for the bombs, 
Uh, and he says, it's it's too late. We're going through this, right? We're, we're getting this done. It sets off the chain reaction where Mother, uh, Mother uh, Endo Swarmer is not too happy and she's ready. And I got to be honest, Corey, the Endo Swarmer theme may be one of the most terrifying titans the MonsterVerse has created. This scene freaked me the hell out with all the teeth it had. Yes. I mean, insects are kind of creepy anyways. It, it was just... You know, what did you think about the the Endo Swarmer Prime? We'll call it. Yeah, I think first uh, two minutes it doesn't seem like enough time to get the heck out of there, right? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we could run, right? Yeah, we're going to do it. Click, you know, and then uh, all hell breaks loose with this crazy looking teeth bug, and uh, yeah, man, it freaked me out as well, dude. Like it is uh, ugly, nasty looking kaiju, and. Uh, yeah, I uh, I definitely would have blown that thing up. So, no, uh, yeah, yeah, let him blow that thing up. So. <laughs> you know, one thing I did thought about, and, and it somewhat breaks my heart a little bit. I'm just going to say a little bit, because I know one one complaint that people have had about the MonsterVerse is a, a lot of OG Godzilla fans are like, why why can't you incorporate more Toho monsters? Like, yes, we did get Rodan, we did get Ghidorah, we did get uh, Mothra, and Mecha Godzilla eventually, but like, 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 give us, give us some more, you know, like we, we want all of it. Uh, I think this was an opportunity where maybe the endo swarmer could be one of the larva states or, or early stages of Megalon. Cause it kind of looks like Megalon, right? It's a beetle theme. Um, so it, it would be dope if it, turned into megalon at one point but i feel like whoever designed this particular titan is an og godzilla fan it was kind of like i'm gonna throw in some megalon in this you know so it's clearly in not megalon but i, I it would have been cool if maybe there was some little hint at it or yeah. something you know early stages of it or if maybe they call it titanus megalon at some point but um Javon, you don't think it looks like Megalon? I mean, it's it's a beetle and even has the kind of the horn thing. I, I don't say it's like it's full on Megalon. And I'm not saying it's Megalon. I just think it would have been kind of a fun little thing for OG Godzilla fans if they wanted to do something that was like, hey, it's an early stage. It's not the full on uh, Titanus Megalon yet, but something they could have had fun with, maybe. Uh, Javon says, oh, sorry, go back to that. One of the whole points and theme of the MonsterVerse is that the humans with a, or good or bad intentions can predict or stop the can't predict or stop the Titans. The best they can do is coexist. Lee is being wrong fits in that. Yeah, uh, it does. Because Sarah Zhao says that, right? Like we must figure out a world in where we coexist with Titans, with Gojira, not to destroy them. It, it is very much that difference in that pull with it. Um, yeah, I know. It's interesting. Uh, Javon says legendary won't pay Toho millions. Yeah, I've said that in an earlier show too. That it's it's likely we won't get any references to uh, another Toho time for the simple fact of the licensing fees when they have to pay. You know, I think that's part of why maybe in Godzilla King of the Monsters they felt like they went too far with having three guys in there. Uh, and they wanted to, you know, who knows, for budgetary reasons, they probably went back and why Godzilla Kong, the new empire, could not really bring in any more Toho monsters. They might just keep making new ones, which is fine. I think that's cool, too. Um, as you all saw, they have tried to kill Titans and failed. Yeah, exactly, Crash. Um, but, you know, of course, now that they have set off this train ration, this Beatles causing havoc uh shaw as may starts to fall into the hollow earth portal because the beetles after her and uh shaw is now holding on to kate just the way he did with keiko it's kind of a, a moment for him like you can tell like probably the horrors of are flashing before his eyes once again you know not wanting to to let this happen and in all fairness he didn't let go this time he well i mean he didn't really have a chance to hold on to her last time but he, you know what this meant to him in this moment. To me, it kind of reminded me of that scene, Corey, in Amazing, not Amazing, um, uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, when Andrew Garfield gets to save, um, oh yeah, you know Absolutely. Peter Parker's, uh, you know May Wat, uh, Mary yeah, Jane Watson. Um, that like for him, this 
not so much a redemption, but you know in that moment what it meant to him. He wasn't going to let go, and he was going to whether they go together, you know, they'll 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 have that, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I really liked that moment, but of course they fall into Hollow Earth, or at least possibly it could be a chamber of Hollow Earth. But we get this crazy moment, right? Like it leaves us on this cliffhanger that we're like, what happened? Because the bombs go off, that Hollow Earth portal is going to be closed. Where do they go? You know, and it throws in so many potential issues that maybe they'll answer in the next episode. Like with Nathan Lynn, who was in Godzilla versus Kong, he explains that his brother, when he tried to go through Hollow Earth, the gravity shift caused an implosion basically and killed his brother in a second and his entire crew, which is why they had to create those specific vehicles to travel through Hollow Earth. So when that gravitational shift happened, that they wouldn't be killed. You know, hopefully they explain if, you know, they do, obviously they are going to survive this. You know, you can't kill off your <laughs> three main characters. So hopefully they explain maybe if because they were with the this Endoswarmer Titan creature, that maybe that allowed them to travel safely through Hollow Earth, mm -hmm. or maybe they didn't go all the way through Hollow Earth. Maybe they're just in a sub chamber level where it's not completely through that portal where they go 500 miles per second. You know, maybe it's something like that. Corey, what do you have any theories on that? Yeah, no, uh, I, I thought similar to, to that, but I also, you know, wanted to say just because somebody one person went through a hollow earth portal uh and died immediately doesn't mean that all hollow earth portals or things like that uh can have the same um reaction you know so it's like i i, I think there is some things that they can play with here but they are going to have to explain it ultimately you know like it, and it's going to have to make you know as much sense as it possibly can for us but um i i you know i i think they survived and uh i think uh um somebody's gonna be waiting or find them yeah and and as uh shaw even kind of said he's been to hollow earth right he's seen it talking about operation hourglass and he kind of references that it's what happened down there is too hard to comprehend right like he can't explain everything he saw or what it was like which is probably the explanation of his age we talked about that in an earlier video i definitely recommend if you guys haven't already check out our video talking about shaw's age explain operation hourglass i'm almost it's a theory i had what back in episode two or three Corey. yeah, yeah it was uh, really you know that i i think is about to become true so make sure if you haven't already take a look at that video leave a comment about your thoughts about that theory um but i think that's going to be an insane moment but it also shows Corey, if they do survive this keiko is probably alive down there right mm -hmm. and well I, I remember watching the, the show go down with you and i and we we're like what the heck and then i was like oh my god dude keiko is alive they're gonna find her you know and you're like ah, ah is that, there's no way right and then we looked at the uh you looked at the um next episode and we're like oh my god you <laughs> might be right Corey. you might be right it's you know and it would be such a crazy theme because like you kind of said Corey, time kind of probably works differently in hollow earth it could be that time is very slow uh, mm -hmm. So she might not have aged much. Yeah. I don't know if uh, Shaw is going to get younger, but I, I think if anything, right, they'll they'll age slower, right, and he'll she'll see a, a face that's uh, familiar but has has grown a little bit old for you know. Um, as Crash says, yes, because in the New Empire there's a whole human civilization in the Hollow Earth, so obviously you can survive. You can't, but I think the idea about those Hollow Earth people is that maybe they were there almost from the beginning. It sounds like they were at least hearing Adam Wingard talk about it. It sounds like it's an ancient civilization that was has been there for like millions of years, uh, essentially. So, which would kind of change how our evolutionary stage works, right? Like if, if you go that route of how that breaks down um, with humans not really showing up for, you know, 
like 20,000 years ago or something like that. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's a very interesting thought that it, next episode, whatever happens in this um, Axis Mundi is going to be a very, very big deal. This is going to reveal a lot of secrets about maybe what happens with Shaw and Bill Randa after Keiko goes missing uh, and how they, you know, how they move on, how they go on with Monarch without her and maybe what Shaw's purpose of this Operation Hourglass is, you know, that causes his age to slow down, you know, his aging to slow down. But interesting <laughs> indeed. A great cliffhanger in an episode I feel like they really got back on track with um, doing a great job with flipping between the different timelines and in creating one thing. Yes, there is a bit of family drama in it, you know, compared to the other episodes, there's still that family drama going on. But I think there, there felt like there, the family drama felt a little more purposeful, like, like it's pushing us forward rather than being at a standstill or like going through the circles, you know, just repeating itself. So I think that's partly where this episode really succeeded. But Corey, your prediction, sir, about what we're going to see in episode nine, two episodes left a Monarch yeah. Legacy of Monsters. What do you think we're going to see in Episode 9, Axis Mundi? Yeah, um, obviously, I think uh, we're going to see uh, your theory come true, Trey, of Operation Hourglass and what uh, went behind that. Uh, um, you know, maybe it was uh, to look for Keiko from the beginning and uh, turned out to be a little bit different with how good old Shaw looks. Um, but yes, uh, I... I I, I, I think uh, right at the very end, uh, May and uh, Shaw, they're going to find, uh, run in, bump into Keiko for sure. Um, and uh, my prediction for the rest of the series is, you know, they're going to bump into each other. They're going to find each other. Their mission is going to help May and Keiko get out of it. And uh, Keiko and Shaw are going to, stay together in hollow earth why do you think they would stay in hollow earth what purpose would that be is because she uh, wants to research and study more no no i just think there's going to be potentially but i think there's just going to be a reason why they can't make it back you know like and he's not going to leave her again so um something along those lines where she may have tried to get back but she couldn't because she's been down there too long or something something along those lines and he's not going to leave her uh this time so yeah that, that that that's my prediction on how the rest of the series goes but we'll, we'll, we'll see okay uh, I like what, uh caitlin says here i'll let you go ahead and read it trey caitlin says the reason why i said keiko is still alive if you watch the season one trailer again kate and may are with that ball thing oh uh kind of like the same contraption that uh, we see in the operation hourglass mm -hmm. um ball thing and on the left i see black hair and a blue shirt and it looks like Keiko to me. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I don't know if I caught that. I'll have to relook at it for my trailer reaction. See, I did. Um, yeah, Red Hood Outlaw. I said, don't say that, Super Bro. We need more Shaw. <laughs> Which, I, I completely agree. I would love a whole season of just Shaw and uh, everything like that. But, uh, it, you know, with the things that Shaw has done, mm. uh, blowing up these Hollow Earth portals, he was already in prison, and I, yes, he wasn't in prison. I mean, he, he basically was, called it yeah, a prison. Yeah, he was. He was locked up in a senior home in Japan under monarch control. So would you want him to go back and then still be put under in that, you know, senior home? Or would you rather him live out the rest of his life, whatever, however long it is with Keiko in Hollow Earth. That's, that, that's how I see it. it. It's happier for Shaw, in, in my opinion, if he stays back with, you know, Keiko. Mm. Though, what if it puts him at odds still? Like, that's how Shaw realizes what he's doing is wrong. Is Because obviously he would tell her, like, hey, I'm, like, I'm trying to stop this, you know, like... And Keiko kind of shows, like, tells him, like, no, you're you're messing with the balance. Like, all of this is she may, she may have said, hey, you know? you know, being down here long enough, I, I know a thing or two, you know? So <laughs> it, it's possible. And he, you know, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. There's no way Shaw leaves without Keiko. And I don't think Keiko's coming back to, uh, 
back to uh, back to uh, out of Hollow Earth. Okay. Uh, as they say in the summary for episode nine, Shaw and May search for Kate and make a startling discovery. Kent- uh, Kentaro struggles with his loss. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how Kentaro handles this. I get my prediction is Corey, because we're clearly going to get some flashbacks here. We're going to follow the post GD crew and we're going to follow um, the legacy cast as they kind of explain probably the ins and out of Shaw and maybe revealing Keiko being still alive. It would certainly make sense if, if our Shaw and Kate and may are still alive, it would make no sense not to have Keiko still out there somewhere. I think it would be a huge disservice to her character. if They just showed her, skeleton you know around a pit of endo swarmer eggs you know that that would not be kind to her character and and would be kind of a bummer for us fans so i think if they're alive obviously she's alive um and i love that uh, the butler says what if it was like jurassic park 3 and kate is saved by keiko kind of like what uh Eric does for uh, Alan Grant. I like that. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Um, that, that would be certainly fun, especially uh, I, I'm pretty sure there is a boar titan in this uh, crash. I saw a trailer uh, with that boar titan and Kate is about to be attacked and she was wearing the same coat that she's wearing now currently in this show. Uh, so my guess is probably at Hollow Earth at some point she's going to be uh cornered by whatever this creature is and maybe butler's writing keiko comes saves the day which would be a really cool moment because obviously kate would know who keiko is but kate would be like you look familiar but i don't know how (laughs) it could be a really uh cool kind of scene uh for sure but i think with kentaro uh, trying to figure out what to do next. He literally lost the people that he trusts most. They're, and as far as he's concerned, they're probably dead. This could be the time that Hiroshi finds Kentaro. And uh, Hiroshi and his son try to, you know, obviously deal with uh, their problems, their drama going through. But oh also Hiroshi is able to kind of help find the, able to find the oh map my. of where they could come out next. Oh my god. What? So Kentaro finds dad. And dad finds out where, you know, they they escape. So does Hiroshi see mom one last time? Oh, I, I don't know. That's why I don't know if they would they would full on like stay in Hollow Earth. I feel like that would be a weird i mean already it's a bit of a problem if this crew if somehow keiko and shaw get out of this and they're still around in this monster verse after this show because at some point I, I have a hard time believing shaw would just be sitting around and letting king Ghidorah do his thing you know i think shaw would be one of those people a man of action taking you know or, or maybe he's working with jonah or who knows who knows they they're gonna have to explain at some point how we get to the start of Godzilla King of the Monsters in some way. We did get our Godzilla versus Kong reference. We got our Godzilla 2014, Kong Skull Island. Now, now at some, I feel like the one film we keep forgetting about in this monster verse, which bums me out because it was my, one of my favorites right. was Godzilla King of the Monsters. They need to mm-hmm. kind of explain that connection. You know, at some point we need to get there. We can't just forget about it. That movie did happen, you know, um, but yeah, I think Kentaro is going to find Hiroshi, uh, or, or Hiroshi will find Kentaro, I should say. Uh, and Hiroshi will be able to help Kentaro find, you know, whatever the next portal is to help get them out of there, you know, um, or take him on his mission. Now at some point the group is going to be all joined up again for sure though, I think. Uh, but you great. You get really tinfoil hat Let's go tinfoil hat, Corey. What if Keiko becomes a kaiju for being down there so long? Uh, I don't think that makes sense just from the Godzilla Kong, the new empire, because we know humans can live down there. I think the idea though, is just the, or you're, you're thinking the radiation. I don't know, Mm -hmm. but the radiation has healing powers as clearly as with, uh, as we saw with Shaw. I I don't know. They're going to have to explain it, but I don't Mm. think she's a Titan. You know, <laughs> it's it's a cool idea. It's kind of like Gamera, where you know they have a bit of that connection kind of thing going on. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, I think that that one might be a little crazy. Uh, if they did do that, I don't know. Yeah, if they did do that, I wouldn't like it. <laughs> it could you could be right though, Corey. You have been right that as soon as you said Keiko's still alive, it seems it right. seems that way. Well, if we're gonna go down the tinfoil hat, well, because I put the tinfoil hat on for when Keiko is still alive, so let's let's just go really crazy, right? Because hey. Godzilla is more like a person. He recognizes people. He has a little bit. Uh... I think that's just his, you know, sentient <laughs> intelligence. You know, not the fact that Godzilla was once a human turned into a giant creature. That that would be nuts. If you went in Hollow Earth and you turn into Kaiju, wouldn't you want to be Godzilla? I mean, yes, I would. You've mm. gone down a dark <laughs> rabbit hole, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, great, great... I, I'm not going that far. But Keiko is alive. I I, I, I am staying true on that. Keiko I like alive. it. Keiko, yeah, I, I think so too. Uh, Keiko definitely seems to be alive with me. But Corey, what would you score this episode? Me first? Oh gosh. Um, major improvement from last episode. I think last episode I gave it like a 6, 7. Um, we grew a lot this episode. I'm really liking the route Shaw's going down. The transitions were great. Legacy cast. I think we're back in the nines. I'm going to give it, I'm trying to think what I did, if there's anything I really didn't like about this episode. Um, I'm going to give it a 9 4. 9 4. Ooh. Yeah. We're back in the nines again. Okay. Um, what did I give it last time? Was I 7 1? Yeah, you're like a seven something or seven three, something like that. Or uh, I was yeah. definitely in the sevens. I think low sevens, just because I was starting to get tired of the drama with mm -hmm. uh, Kate and May. Uh, and it was just a weird moment. Um, I hated that moment, and I'm glad we didn't like have. Yeah, a weird I'm glad they didn't quite address it in this one yeah. too. And not that I, I mean, obviously they're going to have to explain it at some point, and I hope they. Sister. I hope they don't explain. It. I hope we just never see it again. Just forget about it. I yep. mean, if they don't do that, like that's bad storytelling. They can't just they can't shy away from it now. They have to go in. They have it'll to be go the all one in. time. It'll be the one time I'll allow them to uh, to uh, uh, get that. That'd be a free pass for me. A free pass. Oh, okay. Uh, Jesus. Um, I I agree with Corey. I think this was a huge huge improvement of the last episode um we got the legacy cast again the mysteries that are going on are driving the show um but also great great mirroring in this too you know kind of showing what's going on through shaw's mind explaining him as a person even more and even keiko and mm. I, they left us on a great cliffhanger that, I mean, you saw in the watch party, we all went nuts. It was like, no, they can't end us this way. Right. Uh, and that's all you can ask for on a, on a TV show. That's like trying to get you into the final two episodes, which are probably going to be pretty nuts and pretty action packed. You know, it, it's great to have us talking about it like this. Uh, I'm going to give it. I'm like hesitant to give it a nine because I don't know if it's that much of a skyrocketed jump, you know, like to be like almost like two points of a jump. What, uh, I, I, I guess here, here's how I, how I do things. Like what, what, what wasn't that you didn't like about it? You know, like, was there much of it in there? Like we got awesome legacy cast. We got awesome transitions. Yeah. And Shaw practically ran the show. Some awesome moments from Tim, you know, like the only Fair thing point. in my eyes that could have made it better is if we got some Godzilla. Um, well, you, you bring up a good point, Corey, but here's, so I, I did throw a couple of issues, right? One, my, my biggest issue is that we didn't see the aftermath of the reveal of Monarch. To me, okay. that seems like okay. a huge moment that we needed to see how the world reacted. Um, yes, we know kind of how they react in King of the Monsters with the government side of things yeah. and how humans are kind of like destroy all titans. Um, but I, I think it, it would have been an interesting element. I don't know where you fit it in this episode without making it an hour long. Mm. Um, so maybe that's why they didn't. But to me, that was they probably should have had, I don't know, a story in the background, just something to be like, We've announced, you know, maybe deputy director being like, I can't believe Tim told me to 
reveal that we were a monarch because we didn't expect this kind of backlash. Mm. Something to that, you know, someone should have, like, some heads should have been called uh, up forth, I feel like. Um, and then just seeing, uh, I mean, yeah, if you can add more Godzilla, I don't, Godzilla Do probably didn't think we should have seen the uh, top dog in Monarch. Sarah, yeah, Sarah Zawa definitely needs to be. I know it says in his profile from the Monarch website that he's kind of a private person and he doesn't like to be in the limelight. He just likes to be the researcher. But we've now seen Godzilla. You think Sarah Zawa would have appeared at some point? And I get like they probably couldn't get Ken Watanabe back into this show. Um, but like they, they just should have mentioned more of like, well, Sarah Zawa is in route to get a debriefing so, something well, of well, that nature he, they may not have been able forward to have him back they could have put a body double and like you know have them like you know leave it a room or something like that you know I, like uh sarah's uh, was not happy that we made the announcement or so, something along those lines right um yeah that that would have been fine i would have been okay with something like that as well um i'm gonna give it eight nine Eight nine. Eight nine. Ah, all yeah. right. I'm gonna give it an eight nine. Score. That's a good score. Yeah, it, episode it's eight. Solid score, right? Episode eight. You're giving episode eight an eight nine. We had it into. We like Dave going into nine. Eight uh, nine. Exactly. What's uh, the rest of the chat saying, Corey? Man, the chat is going wild, buddy. King Donkey Kong, awesome. Gave it a nine. Because you crazy, Craig Rowland gave it an eight eight. Wayne Enterprises gave it a nine one. Oracle Clock. Tower gave it a 9.3. Red Hooded Outlaw gave it a 9.2. Okay. Beyond the Night gave it a 9.4. Crush the Purple Puppet gave it an 8. The Butler gave it an 8.8. 8. Kaylin, uh, nope, she gave it a 9.4. She uh, said actually 9.4 there. Wow. Wait, but hold on. Kaylin, what was her score before? She said 8.4 and she said no, actually 9.4. She bumped it up a whole point. Kaylin, oh, oh, yeah. out yeah. of curiosity. Can you tell me why you bumped it up a full score? I, I'm just not that I'm like, well, how could you go a different? Side? I'm like actually curious, like what what was like the extra point that you're like, you know what? It's it's actually awesome. You know, we got eight five from the Batman who laughed, eight eight from Joker's Wild, <clears throat> nine two from Carrie Kelly, a eight point seven from Nine Lives in Hell here, a nine point one from Trevor H. Okay. A8 from Atomic Kaiji 1954, Akia Lee. Ding Classified Monarch Eyes Only gave it a 9.4. Bat Fanatic gave it an 8.7. And Hashtag Restore the Snyderverse Guy gave it a 9.2 out of 10. We had some awesome. really good scores, buddy. Really yeah, it's, good a, scores. it's a solid episode. And uh, according to our poll, you guys are saying about the same thing, where uh, the worst episode yet got 3% out of 32 votes. So probably one. Meh. I bet that was Batman who gave it the worst episode. Uh, meh, three percent, so one vote. Best episode, nine percent, so three votes. And then the rest were were good, eighty four percent. So everyone's saying at least it was a very very solid episode and back on track compared to the last particular episode. Uh, Crash now says it would have been a 7.5 for me, but there was a Titan, so it won me over in the eights. Okay, you know, and there is something to that. I was actually thinking about that, Corey, and, you know, we talked about how this show doesn't really, you know, for being called the Legacy of Monsters, there's not a ton of monsters in it, right? Like, people want more Titans. And I was partly thinking, well, what if the Legacy of Monsters isn't so much Titans, but humans, yeah. humans yeah. are the monsters in some cases, right? There's always been a little bit of, of that in Godzilla where humans kind of screw up the balance of nature and Godzilla has to go and restore it. Even in the 1954 film, right? Like where humans are the ones that created him and he's just the aftermath, you know, and he's punishing them. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting thought that maybe legacy of monsters has a dual yeah. meaning of not just Titans, but people yeah. as well. I like that. That's interesting. But then you're kind of implying that Shaw's a monster. I mean, he could be a monster. You don't know. He It's a monster in his own making that doesn't I, know that what he caused. I'm going to go more on the <clears throat> side of Monarch legacy of monsters being that um, this is Monarch figuring out 
about the monsters, the monsters. So like, you know, we have the map put together and all these other things going on. So it's, it's the, you know, we're starting to draft up the list of monsters in the Monarch monster verse. Caitlin Laurie responded. She said, cause I love the flashback of Keiko and Bill. They are tr- uh, trust. And I do love the 1950 stories. I find 1950 interesting. Completely agree. Yeah. I completely agree. Caitlin. Yeah. The, the flashbacks uh, with the legacy cast have been easily the prestigious part of this show. Like wh- whoever, I don't know if they had like two writers mm-hmm. who one took over the 1950s and the other took the present day storyline, but whoever did the 50s <clears throat> seemed to know what they were doing with that one. You know, they, they, a clear direction. The chemistry of the trio is phenomenal. Um the legacy cast is where it's at for me. I think they're phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, I'm glad to hear everyone is really enjoying this episode. Uh, for our replay crew, let us know what your guys' thoughts on this episode. Put it in the comments, your score. Tell us why, if you hated it, like, tell us why you hate it. If you loved it, tell us why you loved it. If it was meh or good, tell us, tell us why. Like, we really want to hear from everyone who's checking out this show because for the most part, I think it's been a solid show, few hits and misses, but that's every TV show. I feel like there's nothing is ever perfect for a TV series, Um, but I'm really digging this and I hope we get a season two. I really do. But guys, you can help us out. If you really enjoyed this breakdown to smash that like, share this video, subscribe. If you haven't already help us get to 3000 subs. Seriously, guys, we can't do it without our battalion. And it starts with you guys sharing the video, letting people know that you're enjoying the discussions that we're having in all the reaction videos. We have a lot of cool other videos that if you like Godzilla content, Batman content, Jurassic Park, all the above, movies in general, this is a channel for you. We're making some really cool stuff and it helps tell us that that you're liking what we're doing so that way we can do more of it at some point. So definitely check that out. And also after this stream, I will be setting up our episode nine watch party for Monarch Legacy of Monsters, Axis Mundi. Make sure you guys set your reminders for that. It's going to be Thursday at 9.45 p.m. Eastern. So that way you guys can set your reminders, invite your friends, and it's just going to be what we've been doing. Watch along, you know. Obviously, I can't show Monarch on our show because Apple TV will shut us down, but we can react together. It's like watching it in a movie theater together. So... It's going to be a damn good time. I can't wait to see where they go with this show in episode nine, but it's going to be a great, great time. Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We really do appreciate it. It means the world to us Monarch Monstars. I'm loving, I'm loving all this Godzilla stuff. You know, I mean, as a huge Godzilla fan, it warms my heart to see Godzilla just. Double thumbs up, Trey. Oh yeah. See with with the, the fireworks. If it does it, I don't know. I don't know if it will. There you go. Fireworks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. We really do appreciate you. Don't forget to tune in weekly. Same bat time. Same bat channel. See you later, guys. And here is now a special message from our sponsors, the TT, sorry, TPP, making sure that you guys are safe in a world of Titans. Be safe out there, guys. Follow the guidelines. <laughs> Peace. Peace, everyone. Have a good night. And now a special message brought to you by the Titan Preparedness Plan. With the recent spike in Titan sightings circulating on social media, proactive preparation for a Titan emergence event is crucial. A single towering force of nature has the potential to forever alter the lives of millions. It is our mission to help you prepare for that force. The Titan Preparedness Plan is your guide to staying safe in the face of monsters. These are the three steps you need to know. One, know before you go. Identify the location of your nearest Titan shelter and practice navigating a Titan evacuation route with your family on a weekly basis. Two, run and take cover. In the case of a Titan emergence, calmly sprint to the nearest Titan shelter. If your designated shelter is inaccessible or at capacity, seek the basement or lowest floor of a nearby building. Three, stay informed. Follow any further instruction from local authorities and stay informed using your mobile device, television, or radio. We can't stop a Titan emergence, but we can safeguard our lives. Join us in building a safer, more resilient community. We are here to protect you.